Here's an example of uniform circular motion where we'll look at the net force causing that radial acceleration. We've got a conical pendulum shown here in the figure which consists of a mass, the bob, on the end of a string. The top end of the string is held fixed and as the bob travels in a horizontal circle at constant speed, the string traces out a cone. For the pendulum shown, we've got a mass of 1.95 kilograms, the length of the string is 1.03 meters, and we've got an angle equal to 36.9 degrees. You're asked to draw a free body diagram for the bob at the instant shown, what force provides the centripetal acceleration, and then determine the speed of the bob and how long it takes to make one revolution. Let's start by drawing our free body diagram for this little bob or ball here. On that bob we've got a tension that is acting like this and I've got a force of gravity acting downward and so I need to recognize that that tension has components, an X and a Y component. Here's my Y component and if I recognize that the line drawn on the figure over there shows this angle is theta that means this angle here is also theta. And so my y component is just a positive t cos theta. And my x component, which I'm going to draw up here, is equal to a positive t sine theta. And I've defined my axes here for the particular instance that we're looking at in the figure. Let's start off by looking at the sum of the y components. I've got a t cos theta and a negative mg acting downward and the, there's no acceleration in that direction and so using that expression I can actually solve for my tension. I'm going to rearrange this equation and so I know that my tension is then my mass 1.95 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared all divided by the cos of 36.9 degrees and that will work out to give me a value of 23.90 kilograms meter per second squared or 23.90 newtons. For now I'm going to leave it as kilograms per meter squared. And So now I should recognize that it's this x component of the tension that's acting inward or radially that is going to keep the bob moving in a circle. And so I'm just looking at a, a snapshot of it here. As it continued with time, it would always be pointing inward. And so it would continue to apply a radial net force or a radial acceleration. And so the velocity will keep moving tangentially in a circle. Let's look now at the sum of my x components of my forces. And remember, I'm focusing on just this uh, snapshot in time for which I've drawn the free body diagram here. That changes if we watch it around in time. And so we're only looking at it at one particular instance. So this is going to be my Tx, my x component of my tension, and it's that that's giving me my acceleration. And so it's a T sine theta that is giving me my centripetal acceleration and my tangential velocity. So I'm just signing for solving for my velocity now where I have this expression. And I'm using r, and so I'm actually going to take the space to go up here and say, looking at that, I know that r is just going to be equal to L sine theta. And so that works out to be 0 0.618 meters. I'll use that value then. I've got my tension from up above. I figured out the value of 23.90 kilograms meters per second squared. And I've got the sine of 36.9 degrees. All of that over my mass of 1.95 kilograms. And I should recognize that because I've taken a square root, I really have both a positive and a negative value to consider. And so I get a positive negative 2.13 meters per second. So you'll notice my kilograms cancelled. I had a meter squared per second squared, and I took the square root of that. So my units are good. So what does that positive and negative tell me? It tells me that I really don't know which direction it's going. I drew it going this direction around, but it actually could be going the other direction. And so lastly, it asks me, how long does it take the bob to make one revolution? Well, the velocity is just the circumference divided by the period of revolution. 
And so from that, I can solve for t to get a value of 1.82 seconds. So we've got our free body diagram. What force, does, what force provides the centripetal acceleration? Well, it's that tx component. We solved for t based on the y components, and then we were able to derive the velocity or the speed based on that tx component. And finally, we looked at the velocity then relates the distance, that 2 pi r uh, for the circumference, divided by the period, and we solved for the period of revolution then, 1.82 seconds. So let's take a moment to do a little concept check to check your understanding. A boy is whirling a stone at the end of a string around his head, and the string makes one complete revolution every second, and the tension in the string here is Ft that is keeping that object moving in a circle. The boy increases the speed of the stone but keeping the radius of the circle unchanged so that the string makes two complete revolutions per second. What happens to the, string, the tension in the string? Take 10 seconds to think this one out. So what force here is giving us our acceleration? It's just the tension. In this case, I'll call it Ft. So the tension is causing a centripetal acceleration, and we know that that relates to the square of the velocity. And so if we double the velocity, we're going to quadruple the tension if we haven't changed anything else. And so the tension increases to four times its original value. So I'll add to that, what is the resulting frequency of revolution? And what is the resulting period of revolution? Well, let's look at before and after. We had a frequency that was equal to one revolution per second, and we doubled that to a frequency that was two revolutions per second. So we now have twice the frequency. The period of revolution is one over the frequency, and so that's one over one revolution per second, and that then went to one over two revolutions per second. In other words, it went to one half of the original period. So we doubled our frequency, but the resulting period of revolution is one half of what it was before. A coin is placed on a horizontal phonograph turntable. The speed of the turntable is slowly increased. During the time before the coin begins to slide, you have which of the following is true. Again, ten, take 10 seconds to think it out. Okay, let's take a look. So A says the normal force and frictional force increase with the turntable speed. There's nothing there that should increase the normal force. That you have the acceleration of gravity acting downwards and a normal force of the contact force pushing upwards. So it's not A. The frictional force increases with turntable speed, but the normal force and mu s remain constant. The normal force stays constant, but mu s decreases. Well, the materials aren't changing, the surfaces aren't changing, and so mu s depends upon the materials, and so that one's not true. The net force on the coin is zero. Well, it's not moving, is it? It's not sliding. So you might be tempted to think that the net force is zero. But remember, there's an acceleration here. There's a centripetal acceleration or a radial acceleration that is keeping that object on the turntable. And in this case, it's the frictional force that is causing that, that is keeping it in place and keeping it moving in the circle. So there is a net force here. There's no time before the coin starts to slide. It will slide even at very low speeds. Well, unlikely. There's probably enough friction there that it'll at least keep it in place for, for uh, lower speeds. And so we're left with the frictional force increases with turntable speed, but the normal force and mu s remain constant. So remember, the coin moves in a circle here because of friction. It's the friction that holds it in place and keeps it from sliding off. And so the friction 
which is an adapting force, will keep building and building and building until just before it reaches its maximum. And after its maximum, it'll drop to kinetic friction. And so that force will keep increasing, and it's what will hold it in place. 